Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. So today we are reviewing unit two of chemistry. Um, so this is going to be about atomic structure and atomic theory. Um, a little different format today. I wrote the answers in with pencil and I just covered them up. So that would save us some time. Um, you know, unit one was kind of slow. Just get through two pages took 10 minutes. Um, and, you know, when I get my stylus back, uh, everything will be solved. But anyways, let's just get into uh, this review. So the bright line spectra observed in the spectroscope for three elements and a mixture of two of these elements are represented in the diagram below. The first question says, describe in terms of both electrons and energy state how the light represented by the spectra lines is produced. Uh, well, I'll explain how it's produced. So basically what happens is when you have electrons in, uh, when it's, the electrons are neutral and in a ground state, um, they're pretty stable, right? Um, but what happens is they can move up to a more excited state or a higher principal energy level. And when they do that, um, energy is absorbed. Um, however, they don't stay there for very long because when they're there, they're very unstable. So they end up coming back down. And when they come down from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, that's when energy is released. And that is what produces the light. So the configuration, the variance in the uh, valence electrons and all that is what also determines how these bright line spectros are created. So uh, there we have it. So for number two, explain why the spectrum produced by a one gram sample of element Z would have the same spectral lines uh, at the same wavelengths as the spectrum produced by a two gram sample of, sample of element Z. Same element, so it have the same, you know, like chemical properties and the, what are they called, spectral lines, whatever. They, that is independent of the mass. So it doesn't really matter how much mass you have because the electron configuration for the element is the same thing. All right, moving on. State evidence from the bright line spectra that indicates element A is not present in the mixture. Well, we can see here, element A, does it line up with the mixture? Well, the first line doesn't. And this one, kind of hard to tell, but it's like slightly off. This one, it does line up with one. Um, this one, kind of hard to tell. Um, but this one here definitely does not line up um, with the mixture. And so because the and all the lines match up, we can say that it is not present in the mixture. All right, moving on. Illuminated exit signs are used in public buildings such as schools. If the word exit is green, the sign may contain the radioisotope tritium, tritium, hydrogen 3. The tritium is a gas sealed in ga glass tubes. The emissions from the decay of the tritium gas cause a coating on the inside of the tubes to glow. State in terms of neutrons how an atom of, I was going to say hydrogen 3, differs from the atom of hydrogen 1. Um, so isotopes, right? So how many protons does hydrogen have? One, right? It has one proton. Um, so all isotopes of a element will have the same protons because protons is what determines you know, what element it is and its properties. Um, so if the only thing if the only thing that stays the same is the proton number, what has to change? Well, it's neutron number, right? Because if its mass changes, then neutrons plus protons is the mass. And so for hydrogen three, you have a total mass of three. And so three minus one is two. And for hydrogen, you have a total mass of one and you have one proton. And so it has zero neutrons. Alrighty, moving on. Uh, a student compares some models of the atom. These models are listed in the table below in order, in order of development from top to bottom. Alrighty. So the first question says state, oops. State one way in which the Bohr model agrees with the Thompson model. So the Bohr model is this one right here and the Thompson model. Let's look at their conclusions. Atoms have small negatively charged particles. That seems awfully familiar. I mean, yeah, similar to a electron, right? They uh, describe each other. And so the answer here will be that they both describe a electron or a small negative 
negatively charged particles. All right, for question six, it says, using a conclusion from the Rutherford model, identify the charged subatomic particle that is located in the nucleus. So this one is a bit more interesting. So Rutherford model, the observations is most alpha particles pass straight through gold foil, but a few are deflected. So what happens is gold, uh, sorry, alpha particles are positive, right? So when you shoot these alpha particles, uh, or at least when he shot these alpha particles through the gold foil, um, most of them just went straight through, right? So one of his conclusions was that the atom was made of mostly empty space. However, a few were deflected. Now, why? Well, because alpha particles are positive, he concluded that the nucleus was also positive, right? Because, uh, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So if they were opposite, if they were the same charge, they would repel. And that's why the alpha particle came back. Um, and we know that what subatomic particle is positive? Boom, protons. All right, number seven, state one conclusion about the internal structure of the atom that resulted from the gold foil experiment. Well, I kind of touched upon that. Um, the atom is mostly empty space. Uh, state the model that first included electrons as subatomic particles. So these are in chronological order. So let's just look down at their conclusion. So Dalton model, atoms are hard, indivisible spheres of different sizes. Uh, doesn't really talk about electrons. Thomson model, atoms have, oh yeah, it's this one. Because small, negatively charged particles, I mean, are you kidding me, man? Yes, it is this one, Thomson model. All right, last three questions. The element boron, a trace in Earth's crust, is found in foods produced from plants. Boron has only two naturally occurring stable isotopes, boron-10 and boron-11. Stay in terms of subatomic particles, one difference between the nucleus of carbon-11 of a carbon-11 atom and the nucleus of a boron-11 atom. So carbon has six protons and boron has five neutrons and they both have a mass of 11. So their neutron number will differ. And we can see here, uh, carbon will have five neutrons, uh, carbon 11 will have five neutrons, and boron 11 will have six neutrons. Number 10, write a isotopic notation of the heavier isotope of the element boron. It has to include atomic number, mass number, and symbol of the isotope. So here's how you would write it. So B, standing for boron, and then on the top number here, you have the mass. So that is the mass number. And on the bottom, you want to write the atomic number. Um, and that just represents the number of protons. Number 11, compare the abundance of the two naturally occurring isotopes of boron. So for this question, you'll need your reference table. And if you look at boron, the uh, atomic mass that's stated is 10.81. So if you know that there are only two naturally occurring stable isotopes, boron-10 and boron-11, um, what this means is that boron-11 will have to be more naturally occurring because the atomic mass is the average of all the uh, naturally occurring isotopes. So it's a weighted average, I think. Um, so because of that, the abundance of boron-11 is more naturally occurring than boron-10. So that does it for the review of Unit 2 of Chemistry. If you guys learned something, make sure you subscribe, and thank you for watching.